Good morning, and thank you for coming. Whoa. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Larry Page from the Florida Museum of Natural History. He is an ichthyologist. He says, I'm not a paleontologist. Well, uh, excuse me. He's going to talk about the evolution of life, uh, which to me is paleontology. Dr. Page joined the Florida Museum of Natural History in 2002 after briefly serving with the National Science Foundation as a program officer. And previous to that, he was principal scientist at the Illinois Natural History Society. From 1980 to 2000, he was also professor at the University of Illinois Departments of Biology and Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences. So at the Florida Museum for the last 20 years, he's also been an affiliate professor of biology and at the School of Natural Resources and Environment here at UF. His years of service to the American Society of Ichthyologists, that's people who study fishes, and herpetologists, people who study reptiles, have been recognized with at least two awards. His list of professional publications fills many pages. Dr. Page's research interests are systematics, and you may remember those cladogam cladogram diagrams in our first introductory presentation, evolution and the ecology of freshwater fishes and their environments. He currently is concentrating on fishes of Southeast Asia and spent all of 2021 in Thailand as a Fulbright scholar. In 2011, the Florida Museum won a prestigious grant from the National Science Foundation to digitize and make accessible online all available information on institutional biodiversity collections in the US. That is a huge program and critically important. Dr. Page served as the project director of this effort titled Advancing Digitization of Biodiversity Collections until 2019. The short title is I Dig Bio. <laughs> Thank you and Dr. Page. Ready to share? Okay, Phyllis, well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me well in the back. I, I think it's uh, projecting okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, I was asked to talk about the origin of land-dwelling vertebrates, and I am happy to do that, although um, Phyllis and I disagree a tiny bit on what the definition of a paleontologist is. I do not study fossils. I study living fishes, so I call myself a neontologist. But um, the origin of land-dwelling vertebrates is relevant to some of the research I do, and I will eventually get to that, although I'm going to run through a few other topics before I get to that point. Let's see here. Is this more of this most, maybe? There we go. Okay, thank you. So, uh, as Phyllis mentioned, my experience, um, I've been studying fishes for a very long time. I started as a graduate student in 1967, and until 2005, my career was focused primarily on North American fishes. I should say North American freshwater fishes. And then, uh, as a result of some funding I received from the National Science Foundation, I have switched recently to focusing on fishes in Southeast Asia. And I've been doing that now for, what, well, something like 18 years. Uh, I started working in Indonesia, and this was a result, as I said, funny from the National Science Foundation. We were to study fishes on a global basis, and I became extremely interested in Southeast Asia during that process. I worked in Indonesia for a few years, but the government there was not very friendly, and they're becoming even less friendly uh, towards people who want to study biodiversity. And so I moved to Thailand, and that has worked extremely well. The folks there are easy to work with. Thailand's a friendly country and the biodiversity there is extremely interesting. So I'm very happy to be working 
in Thailand. I am a systematist, as Phyllis mentioned, and that means I study the evolutionary relationships of fishes and the taxonomy, which is the assignment of names to different populations of fishes so that we, we have a scientific name and common names so we can communicate with one another. That's what taxonomy does. And then I'm also particularly interested in natural history collections because they are a major source of information on biodiversity. And that is not always appreciated. People go and look at collections of preserved organisms and they say, well, these are dead fish. How, how important can they be? But in fact, they are extremely important and they have not always been appreciated. So we started this program that Phyllis mentioned called I Dig Bio. And that received funding also from the National Science Foundation. And through that program, we have been able to bring more attention to all of the collections of organisms in, or many of the collections of organisms in North America, uh, not only those uh, collections of fishes, but all, all groups of organisms. And that program has been extremely successful. The collections are much better understood now by the public as well as scientists who don't always work with natural history collections. Some of the funding has increased. Visibility has certainly increased. We've digitized the information. We've made it available online. And so that's been an extremely important program and one that I am uh, very happy to have been associated with. Okay, uh, I know you have learned something, or, and per perhaps you already knew, uh, about phylogenies and understand the information they provide for us, but you've also had some instruction earlier in this program here, which is terrific. Um, just a quick review, the earliest evolving organisms are shown at the bottom of a phylogeny. So in this case, at the bottom of this slide, and then through time, we see changes that have taken place uh, as we move up toward the top of the slide here. So um, this shows the evolutionary relationships of fishes at a, at a very elemental level, obviously. There's just a little bit of, uh, just a few fish shown here. And as I mentioned up the top, there are uh, currently 36,345 species of fishes recognized, and those, those are only living fishes. So um, those species fall into four major groups. And they're given at the top here. We have the hagfishes and lampreys. Those were the earliest appearing fishes, earliest appearing organisms that we call fishes. And I'll say a bit more about that in just a moment. And then we have sharks. We have bony fishes. And then over here, we have lobe finned fishes on the left. And those are of particular interest to our topic today. Because if you look at the phylogeny, or, and I'm not sure you can see all the text uh, as clearly perhaps as you would like to, but you'll notice that the lobe fin fishes are more closely related to the, they're listed here as amniots. In other words, organisms that, um, these are actually tetrapods. So amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals <clears throat> are more closely related to lobe fin fishes than lobe fin fishes are to other fishes. And uh, so that begs the question, well, what the heck is a fish, right? <clears throat> if you have those in such disparate groups. So a fish is a vertebrate, any, uh, in other words, an animal with a backbone that lives in water and has gills. And most of them also have scales and fins and so we have historically, and this goes back hundreds of years, referred to any animal, any vertebrate that lives in water and has gills as a fish, even though some fishes are more closely related to amphibians and other tetrapods. <clears throat> so that group of fishes then, those that um, are more closely related to the amphibians and other uh, land living vertebrates are the ones that we, we should look at to try and get more information on the evolution of tetrapods. In other words, the transition from living in water as a fish to living 
on land as a tetrapod. And the, the most, the earliest evolving tetrapods are the amphibians. So I may just refer, be referring to amphibians in the future. But these lobefin fishes are the ones that should give us the most information about what happened, how it was that fishes moved onto land. And lobefin fishes uh, have bony leg supports external to the body. So if you look at the lower right on the screen there, there are two pectoral fins. One is from a ray finned fish and one is from a lobe finned fish. And the one from the ray finned fish has what most fishes have, a few bones at the base of the fin and then rays extending from those bones. The fins of a lobe finned fish is very different. It has large bones extending out into the fin. And that's shown in these other diagrams there of the pectoral fin and the pelvic fin. So the lobe fin of, the, of this particular group of fishes is much more like the limbs, in our case, arms and legs, that appear on tetrapod, or on, yeah, tetrapods, on vertebrates that live on land. <clears throat> so the, um, these lobe fin fishes <clears throat> use these uh, fins with the bones extending out into them. These are muscular fins. They use those to move about on the substrate, that is the bottom of a water body. So they push themselves along with these bony fins. In other words, they're able to walk underwater and they push themselves along, <clears throat> excuse me, on the substrate. It could be rocks, it could be mud, they could be living in swamps. It could be living in streams, but wherever they are, they're, they're essentially walking on the bottom of the water body. <clears throat> Another characteristic that these lobe fin fishes have is an internal nair or an internal nostril on each side of the head. So in most fishes, there are two, I don't know if you could see my, uh, yeah, okay, you can see the cursor here. Okay, so in most fishes, we have two nares or nostrils situated close to one another, just, just in, before the eye. And so water goes into one of the nostrils and passes through some uh, sensitive tissue and then as expelled from the other nostril. And of course, in that process, then the water passes through sensitive, as I said, tissue, sensory tissue, um, <clears throat> between the two nostrils, chemical cues are taken from the water. So in essence, they are smelling the water. In lobe fin fishes, the external nostril actually has perforated the upper part of the mouth, perforated the uh, palate, and so that it uh, carries the water into the um, into the mouth, essentially. So in these fishes, the nair perforates the palate, bringing water into the, or, or air actually, into the in oval cavity. And so this is an adaptation that led to breathing air. And I'll say more about lung fishes as examples in just a moment, but this enabled fishes to um, pull water into the mouth cavity, into the oral cavity, or if they choose to come to the surface, they can pull air into the internal um, cavity of the body. And so that also would seem to be, and is, a pre-adaptation in lobe fin fishes for moving onto land where they need to breathe air. So this group of fishes, lobe fins, have two pre-adaptations that seem obviously um, convenient for uh, the movement from water onto land. They can walk, presumably, and they can breathe air, presumably. <clears throat> However, one problem here as, is that for a fish to move on to land, it has to have modifications of the fins 
sufficient to enable them to walk on land. That's very different from walking across the substrate in water where you have the buoyancy of water. They're essentially weightless. So they have these lobed fins and they can propel, they can move across the substrate underwater. But if you try to put one of these fish onto land, they can't, they can't move on land because they, the weight is too much. They don't have the buoyancy of water. So how did this occur? Well, if we look at fossil fishes, we have, of course, the famous Tiktaalik, which you may have heard of. Um, this, uh, I think about 10 years ago, maybe it's longer than that now. <clears throat> this fish was uh, discovered and a very nice book was written on Tiktaalik. This was classified as a fish 30, 375 million years ago. It was found in uh, uh, fossil beds in Canada. It looks, uh, you know, a recreation of the fossil would make it look something like this. It did move on to land, and it, um, but it probably was not very efficient at doing so. It moved back and forth, as far as we can tell, between water and land. There are other fossils. Uh, this thing called Ithiostega is classified as an amphibian. And, you know, the transition from being a fish to an amphibian or from being any organism to another organism is a very uh, gradual process. And whether you call something a fish or an amphibian in the fossils can be a, a difficult uh, distinction to make. But we have examples here <clears throat> of some early fossils that did span this period when fishes were able to move on to land. But the fossil record is very incomplete. We don't know what the steps were. We don't know how efficient Tiktaalik was at moving on land, probably not very, it, um, but anyway. So that's the state we are in, um, just with limited information. <clears throat> so coming back to our extant fishes where we would hope to get um, information that would seem relevant to the transition from living in water to living on land. These are the fishes that are closely related to amphibians and the ones which with, um, in which we might be able to find some clues about how the transition took place. You know, fossils can provide some information, but uh, the fossil record is very incomplete. We should look at living organisms to try to gain additional information. <clears throat> so the lobe finned fishes um, exist in three. Uh, groups, the coelacanths, of which there are two living species, the lungfishes, of which there are six living species, and then the osteolipomorpha, those are extinct. So that's not a group of living fishes. That's, I'm just still throwing that out. That's the third group of what we call lobe fin fishes, but there are no living examples of osteolipomorpha. Okay, looking at coelacanths. Um, Fossils for this group are worldwide, and they were found in freshwater deposits and marine deposits, but they were thought to be extinct for, to, um, for a very long period of time. That is, the earliest fossils are found uh, at the beginning of the Carboniferous, end of Devonian, early Carboniferous period, and then they cease to exist at the end of the Cretaceous, about 65 million years ago. So this group had essentially the same lifespan, so to speak, as dinosaurs. Dinosaurs disappeared into the Cretaceous, and so did the coelacanths, we thought. But one of the most amazing discoveries in um, ichthyology, at least, maybe in all of life, in my opinion, was that there was an extant species of coelacanth discovered in, in the 1930s. And keep in mind, these fishes were thought to be extinct for 65 million years, and suddenly one was discovered in the Comoros Islands. That's some islands um, off the coast of Mozambique, between Mozambique and Madagascar, as that uh, diagram or photo on the right indicates. All right, so again, just to, to emphasize what we're dealing with here, this, um, the, the phylogenetic tree of uh, Stelacanthiformes 
is shown there in this um, image. And again, they were thought to be extinct in the Cretaceous. And then um, this millions of years later, now we've discovered a living fossil. And again, this would be like discovering a dinosaur today. So this was an incredible discovery. <clears throat> and how did it take place? Well, these fishes were discovered in, in markets, in fish markets. There were you know, lots of fish markets in um, Asia and Africa. Uh, they have, they catch fishes and they sell them in markets um, as whole fish, not, not really the way we do here in this country, but or not very often. But uh, someone was going through a fish market near the Comoros Islands, and they saw this very odd fish in, being displayed there, or sitting there as a, you know, to be eaten, to be purchased and eaten. And um, she realized that this was an odd looking fish and sh she thought it resembled something she had seen maybe in a textbook somewhere or a book on fossil fishes or something. And so she made this nice sketch and sent it to a, an ichthyologist in South Africa at a university there. And uh, he saw this and of course was extraordinarily uh, surprised because it seemed to be something he also was familiar with as fossil. So he put out a, um, some flyers in this general area in Mozambique and the Comoros Island. He offered um, this reward, 100 pounds for um, more specimens of this extraordinary fish. And they did start coming in. Apparently, apparently at this time, not so much anymore, I'm sorry to hear, but <clears throat> apparently at this time, they were they showed up fairly often in the fish markets. And by the way, these fishes are about a meter long. These are big fish, so a meter at least, uh, maybe a meter and a half. And so he, he did get several more specimens. Uh, and then he described the species as uh, Latimeria columni, described in 1937. Oddly enough, as surprising as that was, a second population was discovered in 1997, 60 years later, in uh, Sulawesi. That's a, that's a long ways from uh, the eastern coast of Africa. And um, the two populations look very similar, um, and, um, but they, they have been described as separate species. So we have two species of coelacanths now. <clears throat> okay, just a couple of comments about them. Um, they're typical lobe fin fishes based on fossil records in the sense that they have clearly uh, lobes on the fins. You can see it right here, right, easily here in this photograph. But they're unusual in some ways that we did not, we would not have anticipated. For one thing, they don't have bony vertebrae. The vertebrae are not very well developed. There are vertebrae there, but they're mostly cartilaginous not what we would, not what we find in most fishes. They're also ovoviviparous, meaning the eggs develop in the, um, internally, and then they give birth to live young. <clears throat> we also would not have anticipated that in, um, based on fossil records of lobe fin fishes. And they are marine, other, some of the fossils are also marine, but this fish lives in very deep water. And so, um, that also is something we would not have anticipated. And that's true of both populations. Both populations live in, in very deep water, marine environments. Okay, so those are the coelacanths. Looking at the lungfish is the other living group of lobe fins. Uh, for this group, the fossils are found on all seven continents, including Antarctica. And so they were extremely widely distributed in earlier periods. Today we have six extant species, but they're now restricted to South America, Africa, and Australia, and they are restricted to tropical areas on these uh, continents. The Australian lungfish, uh, there's only one species in Australia. It is the most unusual and in some ways the most interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, on the, on the Australian lungfish, the pectoral and pelvic fins 
are of course lobed and they're very flipper-like. You can see um, in this photo, you can see one there. Um, they are facultative air breathers. That is, they can breathe air. They go to the surface and, and breathe air, but they still have gills and apparently rely mostly on gills for um, getting oxygen. They're found in vegetated areas of streams uh, and, and sometimes swampy areas in a very small area of Australia. This fish, which has been around for a very, very long time, is now restricted to a small area in Queensland in Northeast Australia. But it's, uh, people are able to observe them, they're reproducing and, and doing okay, even in that small area. Okay, and then in Africa and South America, we have the other group of lung fishes. So we have five species on these two continents. We have one in Africa and four in South America. <clears throat> Here are the, uh, the lobed fins may not look lobed to you anymore. Uh, here you can see on this one here, uh, they, the fins, the pectoral and pelvic fins have become much more filamentous. And I'm not sure what the um, uh, cause of that is, but they are still lobed. There are still bones extending out into these fins, um, unlike we have in ray finned fishes. The larvae have external gills, but the adults breathe air. They are obligate air breathers. So this is a group that has moved to um, a group of fishes that is very much reliant on atmospheric air. Another really interesting thing about these, uh, this group of fishes that uh, suggests uh, or shows a stronger adaptation to land terrestrial environments is that they estivate in the dry season. And um, just a few words about this, because it's an interesting phenomenon. They can estivate. So in Africa, as you may know, if you watch nature films, which I suspect all of us do all the time, um, you know that a lot of the water bodies in Africa dry up completely during the dry season. So the streams, the swamps and so on, the water will completely disappear. And there are certain groups of fishes, including the lunged fishes, that are able to burrow down into the mud and survive for some period of time until the rains come and we have water again and they can go back to their aquatic environment. Well, in the case of the lunged fishes, they go to great lengths to survive. They burrow down into the muddy substrate, obviously while it's still uh, pliable, still muddy, and they're able to burrow down. They go down into the tube and then they uh, secrete uh, mu uh, mucus around the outside of the body that creates a cocoon that helps, that keeps them from drying out. Uh, they're able to breathe air through the tube and they go the, through uh, changes that are almost analogous to uh, hibernation in some mammals. The heart rate uh, lowers, they retain urea, urea sorry and other metabolites. They metabolize body proteins to live during this period. And they can do this for up to seven, and, seven to eight months in the wild. And someone somewhere once kept one in the lab just to see how long they could actually survive without water. And it lived for four years in, a, in a, an aquarium in mud with uh, no water being added. And uh, anyway, four years, long period of time. Okay, so um, these are the extant lobe fin fishes. They lack the morphological features necessary for walking on to terrestrial environments. We've looked at them. I mean, one of these fishes is a deep sea fish. It certainly didn't uh, move on to land. The lobe, uh, the lung fishes do not have morphology that would be required to uh, move on to land directly. <clears throat> and so what are we looking for? We're looking for, uh, or the reason we're so confident that these fishes would not have been part of the direct lineage that moved on to land is that they do not move with what we call a salamander gait. So this, uh, why is this important? Because based on Tiktaalik and a few other fossils that seem to move onto land, the fossil fishes that moved onto land, are um, 
the morphology suggests that they had this salamander-like gait. And of course, here's, an, here's a salamander. These are amphibians. These are examples of the uh, vertebrates that live on land. And these uh, show perhaps the most, some of the most primitive <clears throat> morphological characteristics. And they move, um, in, in, again, something we call the salamander gait. And so in that in that gait, the um, four four limbs and high limbs are in anaphase with one another, so that they're scooting along. You've probably seen salamanders move, or perhaps you've seen videos of them. They have a very distinctive way of moving across the substrate, and that's what something must do if they're just moving out of water for the first time and onto land. They have to have they have to deal with the lack of the buoyancy of water. And so they almost certainly did it with this mechanism that is this, um, again, the salamander gate. Okay, so um, at this point, it seems like not much can be learned from extant fishes, right? We're sort of disappointed. We looked at lobe fin fishes, eh, maybe they weren't the ones. So um, I, should have, I should say here, it seemed that not much could be learned. But, okay, so I'm sort of switching topics here, but don't, I'll come back to the, the theme of this talk in just a moment. So I want to move now to um, a discovery that is a result of our recent focus on Southeast Asia, uh, again, mainly Thailand. Here's just some slides of us working in Thailand. Uh, I always take graduate students with me. Usually we have a big crowd and we, we actually get a lot of work done because we're not there very long usually. And uh, this further illustrates that point. We get there, we make collections, we have to get a lot done because it's not like you're working here in North America and you go somewhere and you get back and discover, oh wait, I didn't get a photograph of that fish, that species, I have to go back and get another one. Well, if you're working on the opposite side of the globe, you can't really do that and you have to get a lot done. So we preserve specimens we take tissues from them so that we can do DNA sequence uh, analysis, and we take lots of photos, and that's what we're doing here. And I have been uh, concentrating mainly on um, a drainage in Thailand that's, um, it looks like it's pronounced Mae Klong, but um, it's some, well, anyway, it's really pronounced Mae Klong. So we're working on this drainage in Western Thailand. It's a terrific area to work. We have been working, um, as I said, I worked in various areas in Southeast Asia, and I made a lot of collections throughout Thailand, but we have been concentrating the past few years on this basin because it's still very wild. There are tigers here, there are elephants here, there are gibbons here. It's really a fantastic area to work. These black dots show places where we have made collections, so we've been quite active there. In the areas where there are no dots, there are also no roads. So uh, we would love to get into those areas and we thought about canoeing in sometimes, um, going upstream maybe and taking a boat downstream, but there are lots of rapids and, and waterfalls and uh, perhaps some of you can identify with this, I'm just too old to do that. So <clears throat> that's not going to happen, but it is a fantastic area to work in. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and when we're working in North America, we have occasional impediments, of course, that we have to deal with, um, often law enforcement officers who want to see our permits and so on, but um, there, there are more interesting impediments in Thailand, for example, something like this, we occasionally run into elephants, you'll notice this elephant is between us and the river, and uh, she had no intention of moving as far as we can tell. So um, we left that and went to another place. Uh, tree and, and pull the cells out. That's a tiger print. There are, tigers are quite common in this area. 
um, which is great, I think. I have not actually seen one, unfortunately. They're nocturnal. I'm not. Um, but anyway, so there are impediments, but we run into fishes like this, and it all makes it all worthwhile. <clears throat> okay, uh, yeah, speaking of the fishes there, so just one slide here on the fishes of other fishes of Thailand. There are some extremely large fishes there. That stingray in the upper left-hand corner uh, is thought to be the heaviest freshwater fish in the world. We have longer freshwater fishes uh, even in North America. The sturgeon are the longest freshwater fishes, but this may be the heaviest. Uh, upper right is the famous Mekong giant catfish, which um, gets much bigger than shown in this photo. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there, sorry, hang on a minute. <clears throat> And some water too, yeah, but this bourbon is fine, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so there are some extremely large fishes in Thailand, which are great fun, of course. <clears throat> but as someone studying evolution, I'm even more interested in those that are extremely small, uh, three of which are shown at the bottom there. That we've collected all those in Thailand. Um, the, the, side, the lengths given, uh, nine millimeters, eight millimeters, and then the giant at 20 millimeters. Uh, <clears throat> those are sizes at sexual maturity. So eight millimeters is one third of an inch. That's as large as that fish gets and it becomes sexually mature. In North America, our smallest fish is the least killifish. It is sexually mature at, um, at one inch. So these fishes are only one third the size of what we have in North America. And by the way, the smallest fish in North America is found here in Florida. <clears throat> it's quite common. Anyway. Okay, and then with all these wonderful fishes and discoveries, this one brings us back to the topic for today. You'll be happy to hear. Um, this is called the angel loach. <clears throat> and um, as you might guess, um, it is a cave inhabiting species. It uh, has lost all of its dark color pattern, all dark pigmentation. The eyes are just little remnants. Uh, it may be able to detect some light, but, but uh, certainly can't focus on anything. And uh, <clears throat> so it lived Uh, the bottom goes up and down, the water pressure. I did not do that. But the, the Thai people who were working with it from my graduate school did go in there and uh, looked at it or found it. Fortunately, um, although this is the only cave which has ever been found, and probably the only cave that ever lived, it probably evolved here and has not else, so it has extremely limited distribution, but it is fairly common there, or at least when the folks go in, they can always, here's a video of the angel loach, okay, it's coming upstream, obviously you get the current there, and what, I'll, I'll show you a better video, but what you might notice here is that this fish is moving in that salamander that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so here we've taken one out of the cave at the aquarium. Just uh, uh, up the sides of the glass. You can notice some things here. The salamander gate there, uh, I described it. And this fish has left the water. So um, the air is not good. They cannot breathe the air. They're still using gills, so I'm not suggesting out of water and live. But anyway, so the angel loach, here's the um, osteological um, image of the fish, and it is able to um, use that salamander gait because of modifications of the pelvic fin. And, um, and I'll show you just a bit more about that in a second. <clears throat> so uh, this discovery that there's a it's a cave inhabiting loach 
but it climbs wall waterfalls with a salamander-like gait, and it's evolved this robust pelvic girdle that enables us to study in a living fish, although we're not able to do this in the lobe fins, we're able to study in a living fish now characteristics that may be similar to or nearly identical to those which, uh, in which fishes first e evolved uh, limbs and were able to move on land. <clears throat> and this study, um, we've, we've published several papers on this now and we're still working on it. I'm working it with folks at several other institutions and thankfully we have support from the National Science Foundation. Okay, so um, I don't think I need to go over this again, but that, that salamander-like gait is what this is all about. And uh, here it is again, just a close-up to uh, – oh, sorry, that's not going to work. Anyway, you've seen enough of the, the movement, I think, I hope. <clears throat> okay, so there are other fishes that move onto land, and, and some of you are thinking, yeah, well, this is – you know, mud skippers, for example, you probably know about mud skippers. And there's a very elegant mud, mud skipper skipping across the, the table here. And uh, yes, other fishes have lived, have uh, move on to land, but they don't have this uh, gait that we consider necessary to uh, relate to the earliest fishes that move on to land. They don't have lobe fin fins. They simply are able to get upright for a short period of time and move across land. Okay, so we have this cryptotora. We have the angel loach, a fish that climbs waterfalls, and um, uh, it's a member of the Abalatoridae. That's the family. These are hillstream loaches. They live in East and Southeast Asia. Uh, we said a little bit earlier about phylogenies. We do know a lot about the evolution of this fish. We know there's phylogeny showing different families, um, and we know it's, a, it's in the family Balatoridae. So, um, you know, you have to have a phylogeny about this if you're going to understand the evolution. It's absolutely essential. So we have that. And then zooming in on part of the phylogeny, we see that it fits here. These are Balatorids, this group, and they evolved from a Nemochylid. They're most closely related to Nemochylidae here. Here's our angel loach. <clears throat> and if we look at the uh, morph morphology, the anatomy of the pelvic girdle, um, and we can see some of the changes here, we can compare it to what we have in the Nemochyla down here, a very different pelvic girdle. And we can study the bones, and we do study the bones here. There have been many modifications. If we go back to that earlier fish, the earlier evolving fish, there was a rib that connected to the pelvic girdle, and that's not found in very many fishes. So that was sort of a precursor, perhaps, uh, almost certainly, to the evolution of these more complex, more complex pelvic girdle here that involved changes in the vertebrae, uh, the, the pelvic fin itself, uh, and so on. And uh, here's, an, here's another example. When we have a phylogeny, we have nice specimens and collections to work with. We can follow the transition, the evolution of this, um, this the pelvic girdle that led to the salamander gait in, in the angel loach. Okay, so that's, that's the angel loach. Um, and I want to just uh, finish by t saying a few words about another related species here. So we have different uh, names here that uh, show relationships in this phylogeny. We're going to talk now about this fish, which is in the genus Homoloptera. It's not terribly closely related to Cryptotora, but it is in the same overall group. Okay, so, and I mentioned that when we go into the field, we spend uh, a lot of time taking photos because fishes lose their color when they're preserved, and so we lose a lot of information. So, and people love looking at photos, they're great for books and so on. And so we take a lot of photos. And here, uh, this is Zach, one of my former grad students, now a colleague at the museum, taking a photo and we use, so we have this photo box filled with water. We put the live fish in there 
uh, try to get a nice lateral view of it. And we use sticks to kind of move it around and try to convince it to look pretty and sit where we want it to sit. <clears throat> well, so that's what we've done here. We've taken a photo of Homoloptera and we put a stick in there and we were quite surprised. We'd never seen this before, but the fish moved over and grabbed a hold of the stick. Sort of seem, seeming to say, quit poking me with that. I'm going to, I'm going to grab a hold of it and hang on. And so, well, we thought that's really interesting. And then to our great, even greater surprise, this fish started walking up and down the stick. There he goes. And so we'd never seen this before in any, any fish. And, and I've given this talk a couple of times at meetings of ichthyologists and other, other folks have never seen this elsewhere, anywhere. So um, we're moving the stick around, trying to get him to walk to get a nice video. There he goes. He sort of cooperated. Um, and so then we, uh, we, it's the same fish, but here we are trying to prod him with that uh, other stick and get him to move so we can get this video. But anyway, so uh, the, the fact that this fish has some semblance of walking and it is related to the angel loach that we've been studying means that in fact, in this whole group of balladtorids, we're gonna to have to go back and look at more, more fishes, more examples, study more skeletal characteristics, and then understand um, how this fish, how this group of fishes evolved and what they might tell us about the earliest fishes that moved, that were able to leave the water and move onto land. And so with that, I'll thank you and uh, ask if there are any questions. Thank you. I, I think that was fascinating. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating and answered a lot of questions that I've had for years. So questions from the audience. Um, Zoom, Ellen, Ellen usually has a question or two. There may be some questions in chat also. Is that true? Do we have? Uh... Ellen says, what oh. defines a coach? Um, okay. I think that is what defines a what loach. Was, what was the question? Mis mistyped there. The question and, was what? And so uh, loach, that's a, that's a group of fishes that uh, it's actually a very um, widely used uh, term it, it applies to just a large number of fishes that live in Asia. Um, it's such a diverse group. I guess I can't actually tell you what the diagnostic characters are. They're all freshwater. They're found in, as I said, uh, Asia. Some of them extend up into um, well, it's actually Eurasia. Some of them extend into Europe as well. And we've had one introduced into Florida. It's, um, I, I don't know the common name, Miss Gurnus. It's introduced into several places of um, Florida. Anyway, sorry, that was, a, that was a poor definition. I don't know, it's just a, it's, it's like trying to define minnow. It's a small freshwater fish. A loach is the same. So I, I noticed that the, um... The, the cave fish um, had ray fins. It didn't have lobed fins, it had rayed fins. So even though it had that salamander gait, yeah. and I've got to try walking that way. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, so it was interesting to me that it managed to get out of the water, even though it had yeah. weaker presumably weaker fins. That's true. That's true. So it's not a lobe fin fish. It is a ray fin fish and it is able to move so efficiently, including out of water, because you may have noticed the pectoral and pelvic fins are very large mm -hmm. and they have pads on the underside and those um, are able to essentially <laughs> grab a hold of the substrate and move and we we were not expecting it to be able to move so easily on glass but it lives you know it moves in waterfalls 
inside the cave. And so that's similar, I guess. Those are often slick surfaces. Mm. Surfaces, yeah. So, right, it's not a lobe fin fish. It's a ray fin fish. And, and I've read that um, among the lobed fin fishes, uh, at least some of the fossils had eight, uh, the potential of eight digits, and others had five. Yeah. I think it would have been very interesting if we ended up with eight fingers, <laughs> presuming that those were the ancestors of all vertebrates, including primates like us. Yeah. Um, okay, question. I remember a few years ago um, down in South Florida, they were concerned about walking catfish that came in from South America uh, they, because they could walk from one body to another. Uh, do you remember about that? Uh, yeah, and that would have been a better example to give uh, than the mud skippers that I used. I, I had forgotten about the walking catfish in Florida. Yeah, and by the way, that species is uh, doing extremely well here, and it's uh, it's all the way up to Gainesville and uh, moving north. Yeah, you don't have to go to South Florida to get them anymore, unfortunately. That's a South American catfish, or no, the walking catfish is a, a Asian catfish. We have another introduced species that also can leave the water, and that one's from South America. But so uh, the walking catfish can breathe air for a short period of time. It has a labyrinth in the skull, a bony labyrinth that's highly vascularized, and so it can gulp in air and can survive, um, oh, I don't know, for hours actually in the air, but eventually it would dry out and die. They're able to move on to land using their the spines in their fins, in their pectoral fins. They just uh, dig in the spines and and move forward across land. And if you watch them, they kind of swish back and forth. It's, it's not a salamander gait at all. It's a, a very different type of walking. But you're right, yeah, they they are able to move from one body, water body to another, uh, breathing air as, as they move. So that's another example of a fish that can move out onto land. And an example of, of how adaptable life can be in terms of developing strategies and physical forms to deal with things like periodic drought and having your, your normal environment dry up and disappear. Um, yeah. I had the privilege uh, with the Nature Conservancy of having a natural history tour in the upper Amazon basin. I learned that there were seven different species of catfish, some of which were very large, like what would take two men to haul it onto their little fishing yeah. boat. Yeah. Um, and also there were smaller ones that could burrow into the banks above the water line yeah. that actually burrowed. But uh, uh, Those are uh, lower Korean catfishes and we see them in uh, aquarium stores all the time. Not the, not the big ones that you're talking about, but uh, Placostomus, if any of you have kept fishes in aquariums. You may know that term, placostomus, but mm. that's, that's one of those mm. that can't yeah. survive well, out of water for a while. Just the fact that they're offered in fish stores as pets or aquarium yeah. species, but they end up, that's how they end up being introduced to yeah. Florida's freshwater systems. And looks like you're going to cut me off, but I have a... No, I, have no. a I was coming because there was a chat. Oh, oh, okay. I have a real question, and that is lungfish. Do they actually have lungs like we know lungs? Uh, they have something we call lungs. They're not nearly as uh, elaborate and efficient as our lungs. It's really the vascularized air bladder that fishes normally have. They normally have an air bladder or gas bladder, people mm -hmm. call them also. And that in lung fishes, that has become highly vascularized. And so they swallow air essentially go up to the surface, take a gulp of air, and it goes into the mm -hmm. air bladder. And then that um, they extract oxygen from that. That's so another pre-adaptation. Yeah, another pre-adaptation. Yeah. Yeah, right. to become land-living animals. That's fascinating. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, Keith Berg asked, what is it the land uh, walking fish are seeking? So he asked that in chat. Maybe you can address why are they going onto land? Um, well, in the case of lungfishers and the catfishers that Phyllis just mentioned, there's a obvious advantage into being able to move over land when the water body in which you're living is um, decreasing. In other words, if the water is disappearing, as the water is getting lower, one obvious strategy is to get the heck out of there, find another water body where perhaps the water is deeper and you'll be able to survive there. Um, yeah, I, I think that's normally the... There might also have been prey, uh, like insects were on land by then, right? Oh yeah. Weren't they? Oh yeah, the insects were there before. So I, I was fishes. thinking about your, your fish in Thailand that could climb up the stick. Yeah. So it, it might have yeah. developed from wanting to climb up a low hanging, a, a branch or something was hanging in the water and Looking there's an insect food. on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's possible. Are local um, lizards and salamanders and so forth, are, are they a result of the fishes that came out of the water onto land? And can they get back in the water and swim, our local? So, um, yeah, so all vertebrates living on land are descendants of the first fishes that moved onto land. So, yes, I mean, there's no other evolutionary pathway, we've all evolved from fishes that moved on to land. I, th I the, think- um, And then can they go back into water? Salamanders do frequently. In fact, some salamanders, um, I forget the exact term, but anyway, some salamanders spend most of their time still in water and others always live in uh, moist places. They are not able to tolerate dry conditions. Um, Florida actually doesn't have very many salamanders. It just gets too hot and dry here. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll move back to this. And then uh, lizards, however, don't spend much time in water. But salamanders do still move back and forth in water. Well, what's the relationship between fogs, toads, and salamanders? Well, um, so salamanders represent the earliest branch of amphibians that are still living. And then frogs and toads are more highly evolved, mean, meaning they appeared later. And frogs and toads are closely related. In fact, herpetologists, people who study these, don't like the terms frogs and toads because they're interchangeable and uh, not nearly as clear cut as we think they are sometimes. Okay, I think I lost. Um, Bill Kem had a question, but I think he's gone. All right, El pardon me, Ellen, go ahead and unmute. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, terrific, terrific presentation. Um, I was familiar in South Florida with something that park rangers told us were obligate air breathers, but I'm thinking maybe they're facultative air breathers, and they said to tarpon, the um, gar and the largemouth bass all could breathe air from the surface when the you know heat had evaporated all the oxygen in the shallow ponds they lived in. Is that true, do you think? Um, only partially, I think. No, you're right. They, they are not um, obligate air breathers. All of those are facultative air breathers. Uh, gars live very close to the surface and they also have vascularized air, air, air bladders and do rely, especially in uh, swamps where the water and the, the oxygen in the water is very low, they often come to the surface and take a gulp of air, just as the lungfishes do. Um, I'm not familiar with largemouth bass breathing air. I'm not sure that's correct. And, um, but, but none of those are obligate air breathers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, I think we got them. Yeah, we go. Okay. Further questions? Um, 
I'm, I think I'm out of questions too. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.